good to see all of you. So glad that you're here for our worship service this morning. We're excited about it, excited about the uh, baptism that follows our service this morning. And we had donuts this morning earlier, so everybody should be feeling a, a good steady amount of sugar. Just don't let it drop during the service, okay? But uh, we're glad that you're all here. If you're a guest with us this morning, and this is your first time ever, sometime during the service today, there's a QR code here. If you don't mind scanning it and filling out a virtual uh, visitor's card so that we can have a record of your visit. If you don't do any virtual stuff, there are some paper ones over there by the door, but we know in today's culture, most people like to do things virtually. So please do that when you get a chance, all right? Well, let's go ahead and stand this morning. We're gonna open our service with Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing and Be Thou My Vision. in the bulletin and on the streams this morning. One is, of course, if you are a first time, maybe second time guest, yeah, that just let us know you're here. But the other one is important if you have a parent 
and are sending your kids to children's church uh, a little later in the service. There is, like I said, a uh, code that will run across the screen every once in a while, but also you'll find it in your bulletin. If you could just scan that, it's a way to check in your kid, let them know that uh, you know they're here and who can pick them up, that kind of thing. Uh, we're starting to do that just uh, for a little bit to promote consistency and also for safety reasons, things like that. So again, if you have a child going to children's church, please make sure to scan that. As far as announcements coming up for this week, I don't have a whole lot for you. Uh, I do want to remind you that not only was today Donut Sunday, but uh, it's also our building. I also want to point out that on the 6th of May, there's the community baby shower at 2 p.m. Ladies, you are invited to that. Uh, it's an opportunity you have to kind of share some hope with uh, maybe some mothers who may not be, have expected to be in the situation they're in, and it's an opportunity for you to share Christ with them, uh, and just to be there with them and to show love for them as well. As the pastor said earlier, we are having a baptism service after service this morning, after the 11 a.m. service, uh, so please join us over in the sanctuary. If you are able to do so, we have two candidates, and I am so excited for it. Uh, those are my main announcements I have for you, uh, but there is always more going on, so I encourage you to grab a bullet and then look on Realm and all the kind of fun stuff. So having said that, let's take a moment for meditation to clear our minds of all the distractions that are uh, tend to weigh down our minds. And so we might be able to focus the next hour on worshiping the one who made us and the one who made us to worship him. creatures of our God and King. Let us all give you the glory you deserve. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to be here gathered in your house as your people. Lord, let us remain focused on you, not on lunch, not on all the other things going on in our lives, the things that uh, fill our minds. Lord, let us, on all of those things we pour down, and let our minds be focused solely on you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for holding off the weather that we might get here safely. Bless this time here together. Let all that is said, done, and thought be for you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, and as we did last week, we will be reading the Apostles' Creed, affirming to ourselves the some of the core tenets of our faith. Read along with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. Please stand for the next song, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be reading in uh, Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 26. Meanwhile, the angels question Lot. Do you have any other relatives here in the city? They ask. Get them out of this place, your sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else. For we are, are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against this place is so great, it has reached the Lord, and he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughters, fiancés, quick, get out of the city. The Lord is about to destroy it. But the young men thought he was only joking. At dawn, the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now, or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angel seized his hand in the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city. The Lord was more merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life and you have shown such great kindness, but I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there and I would soon die. See, there is a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said, I will grant you your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utter, utterly destroyed them, along with the other cities and villages of, their, of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day that you bless us with, for the opportunity to gather here. I thank you for each and every one that's here today. I ask that you would continue to watch over us and allow us to continue to, to grow in you. And now as we give back a portion of our blessings to you, I ask that you would bless the giver and the gift. In Jesus' name, amen.
sure you scan that code, please, and fill out that information. And any kids, K through 5th. March of 2020, I spent all day getting ready for one of the greatest things in my life, which was going to see my third favorite musical, Les Mis. Les Mis. I had to drive to Durham, had to get the, the kids to my great grandmother's house to drop them off because they weren't interested in that. And, had to get ready, get dressed, I had to get my hair done, you know, that, that took a little while. And Joanna had to get ready and drive an hour and 15 minutes all the way out there and uh, went to Tobacco Road and was halfway through dinner and we got a text message that due to some virus that was going around called COVID-19, they had canceled the performance that evening. And I was heartbroken. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what a wasted day, right? What a wasted day. I'd spent all day. I mean, I had been building up to this. I could barely sleep the night before. I was so excited. I got up. There was a spring in my step. I spent all day preparing and, and getting ready and driving and going. And then it was canceled. What a wasted day. How many of you honestly have had a wasted day before? Raise your hand. I figured there'd be a couple of them. A wasted day is not a tragedy. It happens from time to time, right? We think we're going to do something and then it doesn't end up happening and it's not a hello. I can be louder, don't worry. <laughs> A wasted day is, is, not a, is not a tragedy. It's not in, in any frame of reference a tragedy. But a wasted life is. A wasted life is a complete tragedy. When I read about Lot in the passage we read that Martin read for us this morning and that I'm going to look at here, when I think about Lot, one thought comes to my mind. What a wasted life. What a tragedy. What a wasted life. He had everything he could possibly need. He had Abraham as his uncle. He had immeasurable riches. Because remember when the Abraham and Lot, they were together, both of them had too many um, servants and too many uh, cattle and goats and everything. They had to separate. He was wealthy. He had all the money he could ever want. And he squandered it all. What a tragedy. A wasted day, not a tragedy. A wasted life like Lot's is a tragedy. You know, as I study the Bible, there are some other people that I think of that I say, what a waste. What a wasted life. You know what I think of? First of all, I think of Samson. The strongest man that ever lived, after me, of course, the strongest man that ever lived. You read some of the stuff he did, how strong he was, you're like, wow. And then... He got matched with the wrong woman. Delilah. Right? Y'all remember that radio show? 
the old crowd this morning really remembered it, Delilah. And she pestered and nagged him until he told her the secret to his strength was in his hair. She cut his hair, and at the end of Samson's life, we see him pushing a grain mill with his eyes gouged out of his head, begging God to give him strength one last time so that he could push the pillars down, kill himself and everybody inside. And you know what I think when I read Samson's story? What a waste. What a tragedy. What a wasted life. He could have done so much. You know who else I think of when I think of a wasted life? I think of Solomon. Somebody's not happy, are they? I think of Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. What potential he had. But the man of wisdom became indulgent and self-indulgent self and multiplied his wealth, multiplied his wives, multiplied his sexual partners. And at the end of Solomon's life, you see him building false gods, temples to false gods all over the land to please his wives. And I think to myself, when I read about Solomon, what a waste. What a wasted life. He could have done so many more things for God than he did. And my goal for you this morning in this sermon is for you to understand how to not become like Lot, Solomon, or Samson. Because it will not be a tragedy for you to waste a day. But it will be a tragedy for you to waste your life. And some of you this morning might be wasting your life. And as we look at this passage of scripture this morning, I'm going to hopefully give you three truths that you can apply to your life to help you not waste it. It's the things that Lot didn't do. And if you would have, maybe the story would have been different. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. Let's read that again so that we know what we're talking about. Remember the angels have come in. They've told Lot they're getting ready to destroy the city. There's that whole thing that happened last week, uh, which we won't go into. But then verse 12, then the angels said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against the people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy this city. Now notice the last part of this verse. This is what I want to uh, focus on. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Let's understand what's happening. The two angels have come in and they let not Lot know the plague. God had not found the ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God's judgment was coming. He was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the angels gave Lot a warning, and here's what they told him. Grab your family and run. Get out of here. And so what does Lot do? Lot immediately runs to his son's-in-law's house and he bangs on the door. Can you get the picture? Right? These are real events that really took place. He's banging on the door. His son-in-law, who's betrothed to his daughter, opens the door and Lot just begins to frantically tell him, the Lord has told me that he's getting ready to destroy the city that we live in. You need to pack up your things and let's go. Get your Cheetos. Get your Pepsis. Get your picture of your family. Get your stuffed animal. And we got to get out of here. And notice their response. And they thought he was joking. <laughs> what are you talking about? They opened the windows. Everybody's going to work. Everything looks the same. Nothing's going to happen to our city. What are you talking about? Here's the question. Why did they think he was joking? Why, why were they so quick to laugh at him? I think there's a reason. 
I think Lot in his family had never spoken seriously enough about God that they would take his word seriously now. I don't, I don't think the family of Lot was reared in the right way. I don't think they, they said prayers before supper. I don't think they did their devotions at night. I don't think that Lot referenced or talked about Scripture. And this is odd for Lot to be at our door now telling us what the Lord is about to do. It seems to me that Lot had spent so much time in foolish living that when he talks about spiritual things, nobody believes him. His family laughs at him. They mock him. They ridicule him. What are you talking about, Lot? You're crazy, man. The Lord? Which I think brings us to a very important first point to not waste your life. And on the back of your bulletin is a thing with blanks. You love the blanks, so I put them in every week for you. The first thing is this. Make sure your family and friends know you take the Lord and His Word seriously. If you don't want to waste your life, make sure your friends and family know that you take God seriously. Listen, there's always a time for joking. There's always a time for cutting up. If you're around me a lot, I like to joke a little bit, okay? If you know me, we have a lot of fun together uh, outside of church. But listen, when we're reading the Word of God, when we're studying the Word of God, when we're talking about the Lord, we are serious about these things. It's not a joking matter. Are you guilty of your friends and family not knowing that you take the Lord seriously? Let me ask you a question. If you went to work tomorrow and started talking to them about what God had done in your life today, would they think you were joking because you've never talked about God before? What is he talking about? He lost his mind. People should know. They might know that you're a fun-loving person, that you love life, but they should know about you that that person takes God seriously. They know that about you. Lot didn't do that. And so when he came to him and told him what God was going to do, they just laughed at him. But then look at what happens in verses 15 through 16. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, get up, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. Notice the three words in verse 16. But he hesitated. But he hesitated hesitate because of the Lord's compassion for him the man grabbed his hand his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters they brought him out and left him outside the city the angels are coming in they're expressing the urgency of the situation they're saying lot if you don't get out of here now you're going to be destroyed with the city and lot has a decision to make he could believe in faith that that's going to happen or he could not believe and stay now, after seeing, if I was Lot, and I'm not, but if I was Lot, and the night before, the two guys that were staying in my home blinded everybody around, and they told me, you need to get out of the city, it's going to be burning down, my tail would have been out of that city. I would have gotten out and forgotten with my family and had to go back in and get them, you know what I mean? I would have been out of there. But what does it say? What happened with Lot? Those three words don't miss them. But he hesitated. But he hesitated. Lot thinks about his possessions. Lot thinks about his friends. Lot thinks about his business. Lot thinks. Love the things of this world. He can't make up his mind what to do. Lot loved this city. I read what one commentator said. Listen to this. I thought this was good. Lot's heart was in Sodom long before his body arrived there. He hesitated. He hesitated. I don't, I, I, I don't know what to do. Should I stay here? I don't, I don't want to lose all of this. Uh, listen, for Lot to leave would mean he'd be a nomad, a wanderer, without money, without riches. He's going to lose everything. That's too much for Lot to believe. Some of you, I believe, God has called you to do great things. 
But what could be said about you is, but he hesitated. But she hesitated. God has called you to do it. You know that God's calling you to do it. Listen, it might be something big. It might be something small. But he hesitated. In my 20 years of ministry, there have only been a handful of people who, under my preaching, have decided to go into the ministry in different ways. Missionary, youth pastor, pastor. There's been Jordan, and then I was thinking later, I said in the first service, I don't think there was any. There was maybe one, one other that I know of. Do I think that God is not calling people within my church to do ministry? No, I think he is. You know what I think the problem is? But he hesitated. But she hesitated. God, if I, if I obey and I go, look at all the things I'm going to have to leave behind. I mean, what's the one reason you would not go to the mission field today if God called you? You're sitting here thinking, I wouldn't go to the mission field. I can't leave all this stuff up, God. But he hesitated. Don't hesitate. That's easier said than done. But I believe in this size of our church, God is calling. And maybe he's not calling you to be a missionary. Listen, I'm not. God doesn't call everybody to be a missionary. God doesn't call everybody to be a pastor. Let me say, if God does call you to be a pastor, you should obey. But if God is not calling you to be a pastor, you don't want to be a pastor. I can assure you of that. But God might be calling you to something small. God might be calling you to do something in your church. God might be calling you to be baptized. Don't hesitate. Obey God and leave the consequences to Him. To steal from Nike, if God is calling you to do something, just do it. Because if you don't, you might end up wasting your life. I want to hear when I get to heaven. I don't, I don't care if, I don't care about, a, you know, we always think about a mansion over the hill. I don't need a mansion. A shack in heaven is enough for me. All I want to hear is when I get there, Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Some of us are going to get there and God's going to say, you could have been a good and faithful servant, but you hesitated. Why did you hesitate? I would give you far more than anything you ever gave away. I would bless you far more with stuff than what you would have to leave behind. Today, is God calling you to do something, but you're like Lot, you are hesitating. Don't straddle the fence because I don't want you to waste your life. doesn't allow Lot to hesitate very long in verse 16. The angels grab Lot's hand and his family and start said, here's the instructions. Run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the planet. Three instructions as clear as night and day. Run. Don't look back. Don't stop. Those are the three instructions, right? Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. And then there's this whole conversation. Just for sake of time, I, I'm going to uh, skip down to verse 23. This conversation about where Lot wants to end up. And I, I'm just not going to read it for a second time. But look at verse 23. The sun had risen over the land of Zoar when Lot reached, I'm, I'm sorry, the land when Lot reached Zoar. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the cities. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and whatever grew on the ground. Then notice this phrase. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. You can actually go to Israel today and there is a place that's a pillar of salt. And it has a sign that says Lot's wife. I'm serious, they have a place. Probably have to pay five dollars to see it, but I don't know if it's Lot's wife or not. But you can see that the angels very clearly told them what they were supposed to do. Run, right? Run, don't look back, and don't stop. 
Lot's wife decided to disobey and look back at her beloved city. Now the word that's used here I found interesting. It's not like a quick glance. It's a lingering look. So if Sodom and Gomorrah was behind me and I was running, I know that that's a far-fetched imagination, but, and I'm running, she didn't just, she didn't just, that's just glancing over your shoulder. What the passage says is she turned around and stared at me. My beloved city was being destroyed. Maybe there was tears in her eyes, I don't know. She stood there and stared at it. Angels had told her very quick and clearly, do not do that. And what happens? God turns her into a pillar of salt. You say, that's like a fairy tale. I can't believe that. Listen, as I say all the time, if you can believe Genesis 1, 1, that there's a God who can speak the universe into existence, he can turn people into salt and pepper anytime he chooses. God can do whatever he wants to do. Lot's wife has become a big reminder for us to not disobey and look back. Even Jesus used it in Luke 17, 32. Y'all want to memorize a Bible verse today? Luke 17, 32. Here's what Jesus said. Remember Lot's wife. That's it. You memorized a Bible verse today. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the end of time. I believe he's talking about the tribulation period. He says, when you're fleeing, don't turn around and look back. Just keep your eyes forward and keep going. The point is clear. When God has called us to do something, we must obey and not look behind at what we've left behind. If we're constantly looking behind, you're going to waste your life. Here brings point number three. Don't look back. Keep your hand to the plow. God calls you to do something. Don't be looking back. Oh, it could have been so much different if I would have done this. But I've done that. I'm in pastoral ministry. I'm thinking, man, what if I'd gone into computers? I'd be wealthy now, right? I would have created something. Man, that would have been cool. But you can't look back. Keep your hand to the plow. If you look back, you're going to get sad, and then you're going to get depressed, and then all of a sudden you're no use for God, and you've wasted your life. So what happens? The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. I mean, the whole passage is about the judgment of God upon sin. It's very probable that, uh, and I read one commentator said this, and I believe God can rain sulfur and brimstone from heaven if he chooses, but one commentator talked about that it could have been a volcano. God allowed a volcano near Sodom and Gomorrah to erupt which would cause sulfur and, and brimstone and all this stuff falling down. And most scholars believe that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the remains of it, uh, are beneath the Dead Sea, now buried underwater. But I don't want to focus on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as we've talked about them as we've gone through this study. I want to think about Lot. What a waste of life. Lot had such promise but you know what it is? He started to compromise. And if you know the rest of the story, it only gets worse. Let's finish Lot's story. Let's be done with Lot. Look at verse 30. It gets worse. And this is why I say he wasted his life. You say, well, what if he got right with God before the end? Let me show you what he did at the end. Lot departed from Zoar and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he's living the rest of his days in fear. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Come, let's get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him. Yeah, you get this? And preserve our father's line. So they got their father to drink wine that night. The firstborn came and slept with their father. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. You say, what does that mean? He was so drunk, he didn't know what was going on. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, look, I slept with my father last night. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so you can go sleep with him and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father to drink wine and the younger went and slept with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. 
The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger also gave birth to a son and she named him Ben Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites today. There's the end of Lot's story. And now I can tell you he wasted it. He wasted it. But well, this was his daughter. Yeah, but obviously he had a drinking problem. He gets so stinking drunk in the middle of the cave. He didn't know what was going on. Didn't know when somebody laid down next to him and when they got up. He lived the rest of his life wasting his life in a cave. A man of such promise. Ends up living in a cave, committing incest with his daughters and having children with his daughters. What a terrible, terrible thing. What a tragedy. You know, it's not a tragedy to waste a day. But it is a tragedy to waste a life. Can I tell you two misconceptions you might have this morning? And I'm going to close with these two misconceptions. Misconception number one, you're here today and you say, well, I'm a Christian. I can't waste my life. Right? I've been saved. I've been baptized. I'm a true believer. You're a true believer. I can't waste my life. That's a misconception. Yes, you can. You say, how do you know that? Can I show you another passage that's going to blow your mind? Turn in your Bible real quick uh, to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. This is going to blow your mind. You ready for your mind to be blown? Okay, I heard nobody, so I guess you are. <laughs> your mind might already be blown. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Say, I'm a Christian. I, I can't waste my life. Notice what Peter says about Lot and see if anything jumps off the page at you. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. And if he rescued righteous Lot. Whoa, 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 whoa. And if he rescued righteous Lot. Yes, Peter tells us Lot was a righteous man. You say, well, not from what I've seen in Genesis. You have to understand what righteousness is. The book of Romans talks about those of us on Wednesday night Bible study. You, the crowd, the Wednesday night crowd, we know what this means. The Bible says Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. So did Lot. Lot, in spite of all of his mistakes, was a believer in Yahweh. He was righteous because he had put his faith in God, but he still wasted his life. He says, well, I'm a Christian. I, I can't waste. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But here's the second misconception. And I want you to really tune in. Can, can you listen to me? Well, I'm already so along, so far along in my life, I can't fix it now. I've already wasted it. There's nothing I can do to fix it. Can I interest you in three Bible characters that would beg to differ? The first person's name is David. David made a lot of mistakes. And I'm sure at one point in his life, David thought he was wasting his life, right? He slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, killed her husband. Did you know that most traditions, the Jewish tradition, says that David was 57 years old when that took place? Most of us think of David at 20 and think he's with Bathsheba. No, it's, according to tradition, he was mid-50s to 60s when he slept with Bathsheba. But you know what? David made a mistake. He truly repented of his mistake and he decided he was not going to waste the rest of his life. And there were consequences for his sin if you've read the Old Testament. But David, we would, we, none of us would say King David wasted his life because he got right with God. But how about a second person? How about the Apostle Paul? I think he would disagree with you. Do you think the Apostle Paul was ever caught up in his past? He killed Christians, y'all. He was headed to Damascus to take Christians in chains. And God miraculously saved him. He repented of his sins. He believed in Jesus Christ. And would any of us say that the Apostle Paul wasted his life? Can I introduce you to a third person? The man 
on the cross beside of Jesus. He was an insurrectionist more than likely, meaning he was trying to kill dignitaries to overthrow the government. The middle cross, I believe, was for his leader, Barabbas. But they replaced him with Jesus. And that man, in the last few minutes of his life, while he's trying to continue to breathe, he decides, I don't want to waste my life anymore. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, it's too late. You've already wasted your life. It's too late. No, what did Jesus say? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You say it's too late for me. The only time it's too late for you is when we're gathered for your funeral and your body's laid down front. Beloved, don't waste your life. A wasted day is not a tragedy. A wasted life truly is. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? I just want to ask you a question. If you would be honest enough to say, Pastor, this sermon spoke to me today. I feel like I, I am a believer. But I feel like maybe I am wasting my life. I'm kind of like Lot. I don't want to get down to the end of it and look back and man, it could have been so much more. Pastor, would you pray for me? Pastor, I really do love the Lord. And I don't want to waste my life. Would you just lift your hand that I may see it, that I may pray for you? Lift it up so I can see it. hands up all over. God's speaking to you. Now's the time to get it right. There might be something you need to repent of so that God can use you. Maybe he's calling you to something. I don't know. I'm not saying he's calling you to be a missionary. I'm not saying he's calling you to be a pastor. Maybe he's calling for you to walk across the street and talk to your neighbor and share with them about Jesus. But you're hesitating. Don't hesitate any longer. God's saying to you today, stop it. I'm going to pray for you. Let me ask you a second question. Is there anybody in here this morning that says, I, if I died today, I don't know that I would go to heaven. I don't know that I know what you're talking about, of Jesus coming into my life and saving me of my sin. I'm not that type of person. Just lift up your hand that I may see it, then you can put it back down. Thank you for that hand. Is there anybody else in here? Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. You don't have to leave here today not knowing Jesus. All you have to do is come talk to me and come during the invitation and put somebody with you. Or I can talk with you after the service so that you can know for sure where you're headed for all of eternity. It's as simple as putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the rest of your life Believing he is who he says he is, making him Lord and Savior, then you will not waste this moment at least, and we pray that you'll not waste the rest of your life either. If God is speaking to you, don't hesitate today. Maybe you need to come to this altar and you need to pray, don't hesitate. Maybe you need to come down and pray with me or Dalton, we'd be happy to intercede for you, don't hesitate. Whatever God's calling you to do, you be faithful. Let's all stand as we sing, I surrender all.
moment. I'm going to ask all my people that I talked to beforehand, come on down. Um, these two of these are our baptism candidates in just a moment. This is Justin. You met Justin last week when he came up with Chelsea. And then we got Spencer and Amber as well. And Spencer's going to be baptized. Amber's already been baptized. But all of them want to join Maple Springs Baptist Church. And since we're all together now and some people will leave, we do it now just knowing that they're going to be baptized in just a few moments. So do we do I have a motion that we accept them for membership? All right. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed by like sign. Anybody? It's Spencer. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Welcome officially. Welcome, guys. Yes. He's all right when he sleeps, but he don't sleep much. There you go. Amen. That's your brother. That's Spencer's dad, so he knows he knows the best. So uh, I want to let you know something else as well. Kate, come on up. Uh, we want to let you know that today is Kay's last Sunday with us. She's getting ready to move and uh, to be closer to her family. And uh, she she told me a couple weeks ago, and I said, well, let's wait until it's your last Sunday so we can all cry on one day. And uh, we love Kay. Uh, she has been a faithful member of our church, I guess, for about five years or so, I, I would say. Always sits right there. She always talks back to me while I'm preaching, and I'm going to miss her a whole lot. And so after the service, I invite you to come down before you go over to the baptism and just give her a hug and tell her how much you love her. Tell them where you're moving again. I, I can't right. remember the town. Gates, North Carolina. It's Gates County is right on the Virginia border. Well, she says she'll be back. She says she'll be here for the 250th and she will not be a stranger. Oh, yeah. But we're going to miss her while she's gone. I'll and, be visiting uh, my sister and my friends. That's right. Amen. So if you want to have a seat and then come on up, okay. we're going to do our, our right. building offering okay. here. Uh, if the ushers want to come down, every fifth Sunday, if you're a visitor, we take up a building <laughs> fund offering. Uh, because we cleaned it all out when we built our new building. And we realize as we continue to grow, uh, we're going to have needs and uh, thanks be to God that we're growing amen, amen. Um, but we, we take this up anything you can give will will help this fund to replenish so I might just want you guys to pray I don't know who's lined up but all right gracious heavenly father we love you and we praise your name we thank you for the message we've heard this morning and Lord we ask you please bless this time May it glorify you and your kingdom and all that we do, Lord, here at Maple Springs. Because it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 